So the the first question, I think, like two thirds of the class got it, and um, and one third didn't get it, right? So the so I hope the answer is clear, right? So if you have a large, so yeah, thrashing rec depends on adding more memory, but if you have a large page, and if you happen to only access like a small component, right? Creating smaller pages may mean that you can you can have more um, pages, right? Because you're not really accessing any of these components. So if you have smaller page size, then you may avoid thrashing, except in the case where you access all the data, right? So if you if you get if you get a page fault page and if you read every byte of it, then nothing will help. If you end up reading few bytes here and there then having a smaller page may help you, right? Uh, <clears throat> the second question, everybody got it except one person who said the opposite. I don't know, I don't know what happened, but that person said the um, approach B would have 100 writes and approach A would have one write, um, which I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that the person misread the question because everybody else got it, right? Um, yeah, the third question was, practically give away, right? Because the, the facts say what it is. And some of you got the second part wrong, even though the, the facts say um, the master boot program understands the format of volume control block, um, the second sentence on the fact, right? So, but some of you said the, the, the master control program knows about the operating system, it, it, no, it, it allocates memory for the operating system and all those things. Um, and so I was kind of disappointed that somebody got those wrong because the, the answer is right there, right? So essentially, like your, your BIOS only knows how to read the master, master boot record. Nothing more, nothing less. And the master boot record knows that there are, so there, are, there may be ways of, for it to know that the name of the different partitions, right? And it just tells you that there are two partitions and one of them has a boot sector, right? It does not know anything about what it is. So if, if you say in the partition record, that is Windows partition, and you happen to have Linux on it, the master boot record has no way of knowing what, whatever you're saying, right? And if you say there's a boot record, but if there's actually not a working boot record, it doesn't matter. It just, it just knows that there are two partitions, and one of them has a boot sector. And the partitions have a name, some, some of the boot, boot records know, but nothing more than that, right? It does not know about file system. It does not know about operating system. It does not know about anything else. And that's for the each, that's, that's what you have in your um, boot record of the each volume, right? So it's, it's important for you to, so that sort of thing happens all over the system, right? If you want to bootstrap, you know nothing, and you have to make sure that the, the lower components know a little bit, and then you kind of build up to the larger stuff, right? You don't want the BIOS or the boot program to know about Windows and stuff because then it becomes um, hard to manage. Um, most of you got the, the fourth, fourth question, right? You know, it's the locality of reference. If you do a sequential, then you keep the locality. If you're doing random, then you're going to go through lots of different blocks and you, you have a problem. Um, <clears throat> for the first quick question, some of you said, you can't really have, um, you can't re uh, recreate the, the, the bit vector from, from reading the disk or what have you, right? Actually, we went through that in the class, right? On, on how, how you would, um, re recreate the bit vector. Essentially, you have to, you have to read the whole, um, you have to read all the files, figure out what blocks are allocated, and then mark those as allocated and go from there, right? And some of you said, you can't be done. And some of you answered that you can go back to the backup and get the contents, right? And that's sort of the, the part of the quiz question, right? So do you believe that you can actually go to the backup and get the free record from the backup? That's also the quiz question. So, what was the what was the what was the impression? Can you go to the backup and get the? So, assume that you have your file system, and somehow you put it in another backup media, the the bit vector for the free free you know free blocks. If you lost your bit vector, can you go back to the backup and get that contents and replace it here? What did you guys answer for the quiz? Yeah. Next. Like you should be able to. You should be able to. So I'm. Um, uh, uh, 
because you're updating the file system for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, is that the same as the quiz question? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's false. Yeah. I thought the quiz question was, could you take a backup and not restore it? Yeah, backup of the, yeah, I, I, I word it differently, but essentially that's what you're trying to do, right? You're, you're, you're backing up everything from here, which includes the, the you know, how you maintain your free records, right? Um, yeah, the, the quiz question is a little bit broader than that, but one of the components is the bit vector, yeah. Wouldn't it depend on how the backup was made, whether it was a direct copy of every block on the disk as opposed to just copying files? Yeah, so there's one component is if you copy everything exactly, right? The other other component is it's a snap, you have to take a snapshot. You can't really have the system be running and changing the stuff, right? Because that, that's what the quiz question was. But essentially, if you have a bit vector and this is how, like, let's say, like these 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 two blocks are allocated, right? If you want to do a backup, you have to take an instantaneous backup of the disk where nothing else is being modified, and then restore it back to that exact same state. Otherwise, you let's say you back this up, right? And then you started to keep going forward, and the bit vector might have been modified, right? In which case, the bit vector is still useless, right? So the big the the free block. Is, is a snapshot of the, the way system is. So you really have to go back and look at all the files that are, that are there, or you need to have it take an instantaneous backup. You need, so you have to have all the mounting gone, nobody else modifying the stuff, you back up the entire content, and then you have to restore the entire content, right? Yeah. So how's like the backup stuff of the SP or just the word? So, so that brings up an interesting notion that you don't, that's why you don't back up <coughs> free blocks. That's why you back up in files, not in the disk content, right? So that's not the whole thing. So yeah, you, you back up on a file, file by file by file basis. You still have consistency issues, so if you do a proper backup, you should unmount all the stuff. But you kind of get away with it because what happens is if you, <coughs> if you have a large directory, let's say a tree like this, right? And suppose the backup program is coming from here, right? So it may happen that this is at time t, and this is at time t plus one, this is at time t plus two, right? It has to back up kind of sequentially. But usually you think it's okay because this may be your home directory and this may be somebody else's home directory, this may be somebody else's home directory. So yeah, it's not backed up at the same exact moment, but it kind of gels with the notion of directory. So yeah, yours was done five minutes before somebody else's, somebody else's was done 10 minutes before, but for the most part it's okay, right? You hope. So, the, so you take a backup at three in the morning because I assume that everybody sleeps at three in the morning which I know it's not for, for a fact, college students are likely to be up at three in the morning than like eight in the morning or something, right? So that's why the backups are done at some point where it assumed no ac action. Because if you want to take down the whole thing, then it's kind of a messy. But in this context, there is no issues like the bit vector kind of thing, because you're only just, you know, backing up and restoring files. Um, so as long as the file contents are pseudo kind of okay, you're kind of okay, right? But that's not the fact with BitVector because BitVector will change all the time, right? Because if any block is allocated, it'll change. So unless you prevent any any change, that won't happen, right? So, so that's one of the reasons why I had the, the question. And um, the, the last thing about Flash, we didn't talk about Flash, but that's why I gave the fact, right? And the answer was linked list, and I think few of you said BitVector, right? So the, the idea here is a bit vector, assume, you know, assume a one kilobyte block. Now, that means one kilobyte is eight kilobit, right? That means there's 8,000 blocks that it's representing, right? So if any of those blocks get modified, you have to write a record, right? Um, so that, so that's, that's the deal with the stuff. So these sort of things is, leads up to what we're gonna do uh, in the, for the next few lectures in, in terms of understanding what the medium does and, and change, the operation, change the file system to reflect that, right? So if you're using a flash drive, then you, have, you may have to use something just because you have those restrictions, right? You can't use the same file system that works on the hard disk on your flash because if you do that, then your flash drive would be useless, right? Most operating systems don't do that because they're kind of lazy about it, but you, you can't do that because then your flash will become um, useless, right? So that's that. So how was the, the quiz?
Okay, the first one, what, what, what did we gonna answer? The first question about the process and disk scheduling. False. Yeah, it's kind of a tricky question, right? Because it's nothing to do with uh, time. Um, and this, and the second one, right? That's that's one we were discussing, okay, right? So you have, so you have to understand. Just because you know the way I was saying it before was everything you do has to be flushed to the disk, right? And and the same reason applies here. Everything has to be flushed to the disk. So when you want to take a snapshot of the disk, it has to be instantaneous. You can't do partially something here, partially something here. Some of the cases it'll work, but not for critical structures like this, right? And if you think back, it's the same as your memory kind of thing. You have to lock and do atomic transaction, right? So this is the this is the way the grades stand. So you must have gotten the homework. Um, what did you just hand out? The homework project, right? Project three. I think one group didn't do it. Um, the TA said he hadn't gotten it from one group. Um, if there's a mistake, talk to me. Um, if for, for whatever reason you couldn't do the project, talk to me. You know, if there's any reason why we can work something around it, right? So if you don't turn in anything, then you will get a zero. But if there's anything we can work, we can we can do it. So this is the grade so far. I think this reflects up to 60%. This does not reflect one person's um, last exam. I haven't graded that yet, so that person may actually show up lower here. They may actually be higher, right? So the the, the line is the median, right? Um, and the median, I think, is like 90.5 or something. So I don't know what that means. I mean, it's, it's, it seems like everybody's doing pretty good. Um, I mean, if I were to give a grade right now, I would I would think that everything about 90 would get an A. So that looks like half the class. And I don't like to um, I don't like to have a magic number which says 90 and above is A, and everything below is B. So if it turns out that one person has got 90 and another got a 89.99, I don't like to give that. So I like to see some like jump, right? So some, some clear demarcation, right? Mm -hmm. So if all of you got like 0.1 difference from everybody else, then that forces me to give it to everybody, right? Um, I have no problem with that, but the, yeah, so the people who are closer to 80, um, if you don't know what your grade is or what, what I reflect as your grade, send me email, I can, I can send, you the, send you the grade, and it's still only you know, 60 out of 100, so we still have 40% to go, so um, you know, if you want to work something around it, that's fine. Right. And if you want to suggest that you would like to bring up your grade by doing extra project or something, uh, you still have time to work on that. Right. <coughs> yeah, the only thing I say is like, if you ask me on the day before I have to turn in the grades, I can't really help you because then you can't make up anything you, you, you can. So going back to the, the homework project, right? The homework project four. So one of the clarification is, um, you, you will find that the minus D option for debugging, without that it's very hard to work with these things, right? Especially since you're not implementing all the functions. Some functions may not be implemented or something. So minus D really helps you figure out what questions were, um, what, what's, what's, this, what, what's going on, right? Like what, what errors were getting and all those things. So if you, um, it's very hard to figure out why your program is not working unless you use the minus D option. If you use the minus D option and you get an error, something like not implemented, right? So if you're trying to use some application and it says not implemented, right? For the most part, you don't have to worry about that, right? So for example, some of you may try to use an editor, right? And editors, if you look at the what the traces they do, they don't actually, I don't know, I don't know how you thought editors work, but editors never edit a file in place, right? Especially like stuff like VI, right? If you make a modification, it makes all the modifications in memory. When you write it, it'll write a new file, and then it'll delete the old file, then it'll move the file over kind of stuff. Right? It, 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 it doesn't it take existing file and write over it. Right? So it may go through these different operations, and as part of the operations, it may be doing some, uh, you know, looking at the attributes, looking at several different things to make sure everything is fine. Right? If one of those fail, 
the editor may or may not tell you exactly what the error is. If you get a uh, un, you know, not implemented error, it may tell you write failed or something, right? Because canonically that's true, but that's not exactly what happened, right? So don't get yourself in a position where you have to deal with those things because those are those are stuff that a real file system has to work on, and your file system is not designed to be robust across that, right? So something like copy file to your directory, something like that, right? Which I believe doesn't do too much funny stuff, right? Even if, if that turns out to be too funny, just write a small program which will create the file and read the file, right? Um, so don't, don't get bogged down by trying to make it as real file system as possible, right? You could if you want to get extra credit and stuff, but for the for the base case, don't have to test it with the complicated stuff, right? Yeah. Um, when we have to uh, make the files and record how long it takes to make the 10 kilobyte, the 100 kilobyte, do we have to make those files inside the main, the, the fuse file main function? No. Or you want to like make them in the terminal? Yeah. So you you can just do something like time, like this, right? That's this, okay. gonna, right? Or you can write a little program which does the, essentially the same thing. Create the file, you know, open, write a bunch of things, and then close the file kind of thing. Yeah? When we're creating the files, mm -hmm. um, should they theoretically be created inside of our fuse folder so that when the fuse folder is unmounted, you can't see those files? Yes. Anymore? Yeah. Yeah, if you, uh, if you unmount your program, all the files will be gone, right? And the files are inside your, the, the, the disk file, right? So, in terms of the quiz, right? So if you if you copy this disk, right? If you copy this disk to disk two, and if you mount that, all your files will be inside that, right? Um, yeah. So if anything takes more than an hour or so, send me a note or something, right? I mean, I, I suspect that if anything takes more than an hour, you're going off into more complicated stuff, right? Um, then, then you need to, right? So, setting up attributes, setting up, you know, ability to create directories, direct, delete directories, and all those things are not complicated. I and mean, if you if you think about it, it's not complicated. It's well within what you are capable of doing. You just don't have the time, right? I mean, you're very time constrained. I'm not giving you a whole semester to work on this the, the fuse project. So, um, and the idea here is not definitely to see how much pain you can tolerate in the programming, right? Um, hopefully, the, hopefully, when you do this project, it, all these things are, are more clear, you know. And, and many of you may notice that it's it's fairly easy to build a file system, right? And fairly easy to do a lot of funny, a lot of interesting stuff with these things. Um, and for example, you can you can create a backup right in the back background by copying these things, right? Um, so that's that's the idea, and hopefully, hopefully, you are seeing some of those, right? Are there any other questions, concerns about what, where we are so far? If not, let's um, get back to the let's get back to the lecture. We're kind of falling way behind, but um, that's okay. You know, these these are important topics, and I would I would rather go as fast as we can, right? So the the next section is so we we we, we looked at directories, files, and how you create them, and all those things. We kind of never worried about what that means for the real under, so where these things go, right? We, we kind of assume that they magically go into some place, which is what you're doing for your homework project. You, it goes into this file, but you never worry about what, how other physical factors, and you need to worry about them. And we, we give a little hint of that in the flash drive. So flash has this notion that, you know, you can only erase certain things so many, so many times. And there's also other things with flash, right? Flash does not let you overwrite. And it has to erase something before it can write something. And the erase operation is slow, right? Because erase operation, if you take the W class, it has to do a different voltage and all those things. So erase is not as fast as write, right? So if you have to overwrite a block and then write a new block, it takes more time than if you find a free block. So you may have to figure out, you may have to keep scrubbing pages and all those things, right? So if you do a file system for Flash, it should be optimized for what the hardware does. And most of the hardware that you're going to use is, is based on hard disk, because that's the more cheaper option as of today. 
So we need to look at how hard this work and you know to and, and then optimize your file system based on those, right? Because certain operations take different times than other operations, and disk scheduling is essentially trying to figure out how to schedule these disks to get the good performance, right? So this this is now we're getting to a point where you can see how all this abstract notion of directories and all map into the the uh, the mass storage structure. So some of the things we look at is the hard disk and how it is connected, connects to the uh, host and uh, all, all those things. So I'm going to go through the different uh, different uh, different hardware, right? The first one is the hard disk because that's the most popular, um, at least at least these days. And they're also the most inexpensive in terms of the most bang for the buck. I mean, the, in terms of the size and the storage you know, and, and the cost, hard disks are the are the rulers right now, right? So essentially, hard disk looks like your CD or a record kind of thing. So there are a number of platters sort of like here, right? And you, there's a spindle, you know, it, it rotates at, at a certain speed, and you have this disk arm, and that records and reads from the stuff. And it records and reads whatever is directly under it. So this thing keeps rotating, so when it rotates under the, under the disk head, you can write or, or read, right? And you split the, so if you look at the each ring, you know, it looks like the old record player kind of thing. If you look at the virtual <laughs> ring, right, you split them into sectors, right? And again, this is notion of the, the, the um, like blocks and stuff. It doesn't have to happen, but this is how disks are manufactured, right? So the disk controller knows how to read in sectors. So the, the disk, so if you say, you can't say I need to read like, some random byte, you have to say I need to read that particular sector. This controller knows that. And we define a notion of a track as this one circular thing. So you take a track, you split them into sectors, right? And all the sectors in the different platters, you call them a cylinder, cylinder group, right? So you can think of them as a, as a virtual cylinder kind of thing. And you number them using some, um, so, some convention. So you can say on the topmost platter, the innermost track would be zero, and then you keep going from there, and then you go to the next platter, down, next platter, all the tracks in the cylinder, then you go to the next one, and then, then you go to the next one, and so on, right? So this, those are software ways of dealing with this stuff, but essentially the hardware wise, this is what happens. So you, you have this spinning thing, right? If I want to read something, I move the disk head across the tracks, right? And the particular sector would come to me because the, the, the whole thing is spinning, right? So if I want to read something, if I'm somewhere on the outer edge and I want to read something on the inner edge, I have to move the head in, right? And then the thing will rotate under me, right? So there are two operations. One is I need to seek to the exact track and then the rotational latency, it rotates under, come, come under me so I can read the stuff, right? So the, the yeah. Um, so within a um, certain radius, how do you locate a specific um, sector? So it, it so you have to wait till the sector comes under you. You have to know where that where the um, the the platter is, uh -huh. right? So you have to know what you're currently reading, uh -huh. and you know how many sectors there are. So you need to be able to calculate to say it's it's all a timing thing, right? So if I know I'm in track ten and I need to go to track six or something. I need to compute how much time it'll take for me to go under, I mean, for the thing to rotate under me, right? So that depends on how fast the disk is spinning, right? So you have to be precisely spinning at the right speed, because if it's wobbly, then you won't know where you are, right? And those are all, luckily for us, is hardware, right? That's what the disk controller does. Disk controller makes sure that the disk is spinning at the right speed. It'll tell you, so if you, see, if you say, I want sector zero, it'll give you sector zero, right? And the disk controller has to make sure that it's spinning at the right speed and then uh, figures out what that is. <clears throat> and, and you can imagine this is not a trivial task because these things are spinning very fast, right? So you have to know precisely when to start reading because otherwise, um, if you miss, if you miss, right? So if, suppose there are number from zero through like 16. Let's say there are 16 sectors in a track, right? Suppose I want to read track one, right? But Suppose I messed up and I started reading well, while the disk head is over the sector at sector 1.1, right? It, it has passed the, the beginning, right? Which means I have to wait for the whole disk to rotate back and come back again, right? I can't, I can't go back 
anything, right? So it, it, it constantly keeps rotating in one direction. So if I just missed it, I have to wait for the whole rotation to finish, right? These disks do, do spin pretty fast, but not fast enough for the processor, right? So you might have seen the, you know, disks in 4200, 5400 RPM, 7200 RPM, 10,000, 15,000. 15,000 is the, is, the, is the max, right? Those enterprise disks, um, they are fairly expensive, sketchy kind of disks. And the iPod and all the operates at 4200. Um, I, think, I think I had it in the previous slide, right? The iPod disk is 4200, and laptop disk, you can have different, uh, different speeds. Um, and desktops typically tend to be 7200 RPM, and server disks are 10,000 to 15,000, right? So the RPM defines how soon you can, the rotational, so th that is called the rotational latency. So if you, if you think of the, the different tracks, right? The, suppose my disk head is right here, right? Rotational latency, and I want to read this sector, and if it's going this way, right? Rotation latency tells me how much time I expect before this rotates and comes under 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 my head, right? So on average, rotation latency would be half the time it takes to rotate through the whole disk, and that directly depends on how fast your disk is, right? The other component is the seek time, which is the time it takes for me to go seek to the right track, right? For this disk arm to go forward or backward, right? If you look at the picture, you see this is, um, this is, this is stuck on a, this, these are physical things which are moving around, right? So this is, you only move along this way. So the seek time to the right track does not depend on how fast the disk is spinning, right? Seek time depends on how we can mechanically move this arm back and forth. Rotation latency depends on how fast the disk is spinning, right? And the seek time usually is the slower component because it has to physically move something. Physical movement with inertia. So if you take, you know, mechanical engineering or something, you'll you'll they'll go through the whole notion of you know um, the inertia of moving these things and all those things, right? So the the main thing that the, the disk manufacturer have to worry about is if a head is somewhere here, it has to move inside. Right? How fast can you move it, and how fast can you move it such that it does not overshoot, undershoot, and all those things. It has to go exactly to the right, right space. And to make life more interesting, you are spinning at 10,000 revolutions per minute, and also the head has to be fairly close to the hard disk. Right? The, the, the closer it is, the better uh, it can read. I mean, less noise it will see. Right? But that also means that if it, the closer it gets, um, if there is any mess up, and if it goes too close, right, then you have a head crash. Basically, it plows into the hard disk. I have some pictures of what happens. Essentially, if it goes too close, then it destroys the hard disk. Because I've seen, you know, stories of, like, I think it's sim the, the way disks are going, it's similar to a Boeing 747 going at, like, one feet above the runway, right? If you're flying a Boeing 747 one feet above the runway, one or some, you know, some, some that close, that's the precision you have to operate on, right? If you you don't have too much of a margin, and if you go one feet down, you crash. And crashing of 747 at that, I think Boeing 747 at 700 some kilometers flying at one feet above the ground kind of thing, right? Um, so you have to make sure that those things are, are, but luckily for us, that's the hardware folks. I mean, they have to make sure that they have to do that. And in turn, so they figured out how to do that at, at fairly inexpensive cost in mass production, right? I mean, we, we all buy hard disks. You can buy like a 400, 500 gig hard drive these days for you know, 50, 100 bucks, right? Um, and each one of them have the same issue. It does, it's, it, it, it is doing this stuff. So essentially, you know, you, you may have seen the, the hard disk as um, it's probably covered up with, with, the, with a little uh, metal thing. But, you know, this is what you have. You have those, those platters uh, which, are, which are spinning, and you have the disk arm. Um, uh, this all enclosed inside with dust. So, because I think at that speed that they're going, dust particle is actually like one meter big. You know, if you look at the um, sun for some example, normal dust particle would be that big. So, if a dust gets in, um, you have a crash, right? And, and those, the, you know, those are the, the, the eight gigabyte on the top. Those are the 
small one inch compact flash disk you, you can get. Essentially inside those small ones too, you have the same kind of thing. You know, if you look at the, the way they opened it on the, on the top left corner, you have the rotating thing, you have this little thing. So if you have one of those eye parts and you can see when it's seeking, some things are moving because there's a moving component, right? So that restricts how, far, how fast it can work. I mean, you can make whatever inside on the magnetic component, but the, the physical movement of moving these things restrict how, how good you can be, right? <clears throat> so uh, uh, there, there are a couple of pictures. One is like, you know, which takes all the platters. So I think the platters are made of uh, glass with magnetic stuff on it. Um, and that's the magnetic head, right? The one on the top left. And the bottom is the is what happens when you have a, a head crash, right? If you look closely, you can see it has covered the, the disk, right? When that happens, disaster. I mean, there's nothing you can do because it's, it's going so fast. If it ever touches the hard disk, that sector is gone, right? Um, there's nothing you can do. So you have to go back to backup kind of thing. So essentially, that, that you know, so the that's the physical component of it. You have multiple platters and you have multiple things spinning and all those things. Logically, you want to treat them as as track numbers. So essentially, you have a way of saying track zero to track n, right? But they'll map depending on the sectors and all those things, right? So their access time is slow, right? Uh, as you can imagine, the access time, this because there are physical components involved, they can never be as fast as your memory or CPU because it has to move these things and they have to start spinning, right? So the hard disk has to wait for some time to spin up, right? So if you if you open up a laptop or something, you'll see the disk spin up for a, for a second. You can hear the disk rubbing up, right? What, during that time, you cannot read anything because it has to constantly spin at a certain speed because you need to be able to figure out where the sector is going to be, right? So the, sec the hard disk cannot start and stop on a dime. It has to spin up to the right speed before it can start reading and stuff. So that those operations can be slow, but one while it's spinning, the the best case would be if you're reading something right under your head, right? So if you're doing a sequential access, and if all the sectors happen to be what you really want, you win. Because you, you don't have to pay the C cost. You don't have to pay the rotational latency. If I have to read this, 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 let's say if I want to read all of those, right? That's the best case I can ever get out of this particular medium. I start reading from here. And every sector comes right under me, so I can start reading. Right. The worst case would be I have something to read here, and let's say, and the next sector is somewhere here, kind of thing. Right. Which means that I have to seek inside, read this, wait for the rotational latency, read that, then seek outside, read this, kind of thing. Right. So if I have something where I want to do one, two, three, four, something like that, right. I have to go inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. So I have to do a seek, do a rotation latency, seek, rotation latency kind of thing. And those are the worst kind, right? So from a hard disk perspective, as long as you can make it all sequential, you win. As long as you do random access, you lose, right? You lose by a big margin because the, the seek can be in milliseconds, right? And while it's seeking, nothing happening because the you can't read anything. So it's, it's basically moving this stuff, right? So if you talk to the disk manufacturers, that's a very hard stuff. And if you've taken any course in mechanical oriented kind of stuff, you understand, you know, from a software perspective, I say go from here to here, right? But from a hardware perspective, you don't go from here to here, you kind of go and kind of oscillate and stuff, right? So you have to have inertia and all those things. And they have to worry about a whole bunch of those, right? The other component is, if the hard disk is never moved, that's one thing, right? But most of the laptops and the stuff, you move around, right? So you have this thing which is like rotating really, really fast, and assume it's like you know, 747, you know, the same example, right? Flying at one feet above 800 kilometer or something, right? It's flying at 800 kilometer, one feet above the ground, but the ground is like shaking violently, right? You're taking your laptop, you're moving it back and forth, you drop your laptop and stuff, right? So um, it has to worry about those too, right? Uh, because I'm sure none of you treat the laptop with like not moving it at all because it's designed to move. So you have to make sure that if it's wobbling, then it's still doing the right thing and not crashing, right? So 
the the the, the next the next uh, uh, um, medium that uh, that is very com common is the the tape right tape is similar to your audio cassette or our VCR cassettes from before, essentially you have a, a long spool of stuff. It's going from one spool to the other spool, right? So you can read whatever is under where you are, right? You, this must be pretty obvious for, you know, if you go back to the VCR time, right? You can keep playing where you are, but if you want to do a random access somewhere, you have to stop and either rewind all the way back or, or go forward. And if you don't know where you have to go, you may have to search back and forth, right? There's no notion of sectors kind of thing, so you have to, you may have to go from where you are, go all the way back, and then start from the beginning or something, right? So in terms of random access, this is horrible, but once you're where you are, want to be, then this is as good as the, um, as the, as the hard disk, and usually they tend to be cheaper. So in terms of a figure, these are some of the different ways that you have these tapes. Essentially, you have these two spools. It's going from one to the other, right? And as long as you're doing something sequential, you're fine. There's no notion of random here, because you are defining what it is. So you can go back and forth. You can rewind and start from the beginning. But you can't seek into the stuff. But they tend to be cheap, and they tend to be um, removable. So for backup and stuff, these are, these are excellent, right? I'll, I'll stop from here, and then take take up from there on Friday. And if you have any problem with the um, the project, send me a note or something. And especially if you're spending more than a couple of hours on a particular problem, chances are you're doing something that I didn't intend you to do, right?